invite you to remain standing as we open God's Word together. We um, will be turning to Acts chapter 2, um, beginning with verse 42. Um, once it clicks over to that, <laughs> I do invite you to turn with your Bibles because they stay put, what's on the screen comes and goes. Uh, but I invite you to turn, to turn there, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 42, and we'll read through verse 47. So, hear the word of the Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. Well, you know, I am probably going to need heart surgery someday. Now, some of you might be saying, now wait a second, David, you're 130 pounds soaking wet. What are you talking about? But the thing is, I'm actually bigger than my dad was, and he needed bypass surgery at age 55. His father had a heart attack when he was 55. And if you look at the other branches of my family tree, every last one has heart disease, just through and through. So it's probably just a matter of time. But I'd kind of like that time to be as far in the future as possible. So when I had my regular doctor's visit a few years ago and he said my cholesterol was starting to creep up, well, I followed his advice. I cut back on saturated fat, tried to get a bit more exercise, and at my next appointment, my cholesterol had come down just a little bit. And the time after that, it was down still more. And at my last appointment back in June, I was normal. Well, well, my cholesterol was normal anyway, you know. <laughs> Randy Frazee writes about studies from the American Institute of Stress. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like someplace I'd like to work. But he shares about research that was conducted on 232 patients who had undergone cardiac surgery. Of those patients, 21 of them had died within six months. But it wasn't just due to the fact that they had high cholesterol or that they were obese. Frazee says two significant mortality predictors that emerged were a lack of participation in social or community groups and the absence of strength and comfort from religion. He goes on to cite another study that suggested that social activity can predict cardiac mortality as strongly as elevated cholesterol levels. The studies show that social isolation contributes to illness and death as much as smoking. So Frazee says, if you feel you must smoke, for goodness sake, don't do it alone. This, I'm sure you know, is a challenge for us in America today. When Ginger and I were working on our master's degrees, we learned about different dimensions of culture. And the groundbreaking work in this was a study of IBM employees in countries around the world back in the 1970s. And even at that time, the United States ranked as the most individualistic nation on the planet. We were the country most focused on the individual over and above the group. And I think we can all agree that we've only moved further in that direction over the past half century. Oh, well, we're with people, don't get me wrong. We bounce from home to work to school to soccer to rehearsals to shopping to dance to scouts to the gym to church. But we're so busy going everywhere that we're not present anywhere. We run through self-checkout instead of interacting with a cashier. 
When we sit at the kids' sports practices, we join other parents in just staring at our phones. Remote work has replaced water cooler conversations with isolated games of Candy Crush. Do people still play Candy Crush? I don't know. But we come home, we close the garage door, we retreat into our air-conditioned cocoons and behind six-foot privacy fences. And what's happened in the broader culture has happened in the church as well. So many people like to show up for an hour on Sunday morning, not a minute too soon, and jet out as other people are singing the last song, just so that they can make it to the next thing. We're exhausted by a thousand acquaintances, but few or no real friends. And our hearts suffer for it. After discussing those cardiac studies, Randy Frazee notes that when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, it's not good for man to be alone, God was giving us more than a rationale for marriage. He was underscoring our need for fellowship with others. You know, we see an echo of this in the passage that we read from Acts. I don't think that Dr. Luke intended this to be a medical commentary, but as he paints a picture of what made the early church strong, he points out that they met together with glad and sincere hearts. So what do we do? How do we get glad and sincere hearts today? What we see in the book of Acts is that Jesus intended for his church to be the center point of our fellowship. He intended for his church to be the fulcrum where we build deep relationships in him and on the strength of those, we have the leverage to move the world for him. So today I'd like us to look at these meaningful, heart-healthy relationships that God intended for us to have in his church. I'd like us to consider what a church like that looks like, what relationships like that do, and how we form them. What does a church like that look like? What do those relationships do? And how do we get them? So what does a church that encourages these meaningful relationships actually look like? Our passage in Acts gives us an indication. Luke tells us that first, the church should be a place where the foundation of your relationships is God's word. He says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, their teaching about Jesus, which we now have in the Bible. It's really common at weddings for the pastor to quote from the book of Ecclesiastes, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. He'll use that to talk about Christian marriage being between three people, and not that we're all becoming Mormon. The point is that Christian marriage has God at the center. It's a relationship between a man and a woman and their Lord. But that passage from Ecclesiastes, it's not talking primarily about marriage. It's talking about friendship. Our truest and deepest relationships should be those that have the Word of God at the center, where we're open to the Holy Spirit's leading in our midst and where we go before the Father in prayer. And so the church should encourage not just fellowship, but forming relationships that open and apply God's word together. And yes, relationships where we can rejoice in music together, just like the kids are doing right now. (laughs) And we also see that the church should be a place where the focus of your relationships is changing from pastors to friends. Luke starts by focusing on the apostles' teaching and the wonders and signs that they do, but he doesn't stay there. Very quickly, Luke moves from the temple courts to people's homes. Most surveys show that the number one people choose a church is the preaching, but the number one reason that people stay in a church is relationships. You might like a sermon here one week, but I know better than anyone that it's just like Cleveland weather. Might have some nice moments, but you know, just just wait a week. Preaching, 
we're sharing messages that open up God's Word, that inspire us to grow in our walk with Jesus, it's certainly important. There's a reason I spend as much time as I do on my sermon each week. And on weeks like this, where I'm starting with notes from Pastor Jeff, I have to work twice as hard. But when it comes to our heart health, as much as I love preaching, I know that relationships ultimately matter more. If you don't make friends at Friends Church, you're not going to stay here very long. I love connecting with all of you on Sunday mornings and after the service. Our campus is small enough that if somebody slips out before I have a chance to say hi and ask how your week went, I feel a tinge of regret. But you know, I feel an even greater warmth when I realize the reason I didn't get a chance to talk to somebody was because you were deep in conversation with two or three other people. Because in a church pursuing meaningful relationships, the foundation of those relationships should be on God's Word, and the focus of our relationships should shift from just the pastor to friends. Third, the church should be a place where the depth of some of our relationships moves from casual to intimate. Now, probably just about all of us have casual relationships. People you see on occasion, you enjoy being with them, might even have a handful where you have somebody over to your house or go out to dinner with them. But you can only have a few intimate friends, people who know just about everything about you and love you anyway. Jesus was surrounded by followers but he had 12 intentional disciples whom he called apostles. And he even had an inner circle of three of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. Last week I mentioned that Ginger and I attended a church in Pittsburgh with 3,000 people every Sunday. And I know for some of you the hair on the back of your neck stood up at the very thought of that. Most of you are here because you like a smaller congregation. But I was reminded at our men's group last Saturday morning that when the church was born, on the day of Pentecost, it grew from 120 people to 3,000. It became a mega church in one day. But to get big and stay real, it had to get small. Luke says that they met not only in the temple courts, but house to house breaking bread together. The church was big, but they were intentional about intimacy, about developing close relationships in the middle of a crowd. Therapist Will Miller asks, who in your life has refrigerator rights? By that he means, who can come into your house and feel comfortable opening up the refrigerator and making a sandwich without asking for permission? And you know, if I'm honest, I don't think I even have refrigerator rights in my own house. <laughs> there have been way too many times I've put something together for lunch or a snack, and then Ginger looks at me and says, that was supposed to be for supper tomorrow. So now I ask. I'm a slow learner, but I can be trained. We should work hard at being the kind of church where we develop closer friendships. We all need to have someone who's glad we showed up and someone who misses us when we don't. It hurts if I hear somebody say, you know, do you know the name of that couple? They, they sat right in front of us every Sunday for the past three years. We said hi to them every week, but you know, I don't know what their name is. We just realized they haven't been here for a couple of months. Did something happen? even at a campus of 30 or 40 people on a Sunday morning, we won't get to know everybody intimately. But we can at least make an effort to learn people's names. You can make an effort to move some of those relationships from casual acquaintances to deeper friendships. So a heart-healthy church, one that forms meaningful relationships, is a place where the foundation of our relationships is God's Word, where the focus of our relationships moves from pastors to friends, 
and where some of our relationships are moving from casual to intimate. But why? What are the benefits? I think my microphone just died. One thing Luke shows us is that the people of the early church cared for one another in times of difficulty. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Christian friends will pray for you when you face trials. The friends you have in this world may care about you. They may sympathize with you. But God's people will pray for you. That's something that's very quickly dismissed by the world. But Luke mentions, reminds us, that it's vitally important. After the March school shooting at Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, David French wrote an opinion column about prayer in the New York Times. Here's part of what he said. There's no doubt that there are some people who use declarations like, I'll pray for you, as a polite form of dismissal. It's a way of expressing a vague blanket concern and nothing more. This is the way that the rote recitation of thoughts and prayers turns the sacred into the profane. But when there is genuine belief and genuine humility, prayer is something entirely. It's an act that, again, presuming you believe anything close to what I believe, connects you to the creator of the universe. For the faithful believer, prayer isn't a substitute for action. It's a prerequisite for action. It grounds us before we move to serve others. It grounds us before we speak in the public square. Moreover, petitioning God is a tangible act of faith. It reminds believers of their ultimate sense of trust in an an eternal presence. It reminds us of the very concept of eternal life. Luke says that the early church's prayers were a prerequisite for action, because they also demonstrated lavish generosity. Now, it wasn't a commune. They didn't sell everything and have just one bank account and all that. But the Greek indicates an ongoing action. As there was need, people were willing not just to put a 20 in the plate, but even to sell land or valuables to ensure that others' needs were met. In meaningful relationships, we care for one another. And in addition, Christian friends will encourage you to do what brings true joy to us and to God. Luke says that the church came together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. The Greek word for glad refers to exceeding joy. It's used to describe the reaction that John the Baptist has to Jesus before either one was even born when Mary visited Elizabeth. That was the first womb-to-womb intercom. Anyway, Jude uses that word to describe what we will all experience when we enter the presence of Jesus in glory. The early church had hearts full of exceeding joy when they came together in the presence of Jesus. Our friends in the world can't encourage us in the things that bring that kind of joy. They can't encourage us in prayer, forgiveness, generosity, faithfulness. As the writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Christian friends will help reinforce you in becoming more like Jesus. They will encourage you to great joy. And the flip side is also true. Christian friends will encourage love and good deeds, and they will confront you in love when you are wrong. The word for sincere in glad and sincere hearts is only used here in the entire New Testament. 
It comes from a root meaning smooth soil, without stones, ready for planting. Forming relationships with sincere hearts means that we'll help one another to remove any of the rocks in our lives that could cause us to stumble. Remove any stones that might limit the growth of righteousness in our lives. Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. If your language starts slipping, your attitude gets sour, your marriage endangered, your values eroded, your ego inflated, Christian friends should be the first to discern and confront that in us. Now, other people might see nothing wrong, and they might even celebrate it. I remember when I was a teenager, I swore once in front of one of my buddies. Now, that wasn't something that I usually did. But when I did it, he clapped me on the back and said, Congratulations, my boy. Today you have become a man. And I immediately, reco- I immediately recoiled. Because I knew I hadn't. In fact, I was becoming less of a man in that moment. I was becoming less like Jesus. As John warns us, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We need to take sin seriously and to challenge one another to do and to be better, and we are to do so in love. The church should be a place where people love me just the way I am and who love me too much to let me stay that way. So as Christian friends, we should care for one another. We should encourage one another as we do what is right, and confront one another in love when we do what is wrong. And Luke reveals one more reason for these meaningful relationships. As he closes his description of the early church, he says that they enjoyed the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because Christian friendships are a positive testimony to the world. Jesus said, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world isn't much impressed with our doctrine or our buildings, but they do take note when Christian people love one another and care for one another. We should want the fellowship of our church to be so attractive, so contagious, so loving, so fun, that the world is drawn to our fellowship and ultimately to Jesus. Francis Schaeffer wrote, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is that final apologetic to point people to Jesus. So that's what a church with meaningful, heart-healthy relationships looks like. That's what those sort of relationships do. But how do we get them? How do we start that kind of relationship here at Friends Church? Well, it's going to take effort. It's not going to happen by accident, most likely. And the truth is, we're going to have to overcome some fears in doing it. Because we fear rejection. What if we reach out to people and they don't reciprocate? We fear overcommitment. We have so many things going on, with so many things pressing in on our time, don't really want to think about fitting something else in. What if someone winds up asking more of us than we want to give? And our greatest fear might be the fear of being out of our comfort zone. We're afraid we'll get stuck with people we don't enjoy being with at all. Who wants to get trapped in a boring conversation? Or with one of those people who just always requires extra grace? You know those folks? Have you ever been invited to somebody's house where there were eight or ten people coming? You drive up, where is everybody parked? 
on the street. Nobody pulls into the driveway. Why is that? They don't want to get blocked in. We don't want to get trapped. If it's boring or we get tired, we want to be able to make an easy escape. But Luke doesn't give us an easy escape, does he? So I want to share with you just very quickly a few ways we can make an effort to start building meaningful relationships. As Ginger mentioned, we're starting a group to meet for prayer for one another and for our church at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, just right over here in this room. You can join the study on Wednesday evenings at North Olmstead. We'll gather for a meal in a time of worship and prayer and Bible study. You could join one of our growth groups. We have one that meets every other Thursday here. We had a really sweet time out at the pavilion this past Thursday. Try a group this fall. See if you don't get to know some people in a deeper way. Determine to start visiting someone who's sick or who's shut in. Let them know you're praying for them. Follow up. You can make a meal for somebody who's lost a loved one or has somebody going through a time of illness. We have a thing called Meal Train that's a great way to get involved with this. Uh, Ginger would actually be a great resource if you want more information about that and how to get connected. You can volunteer on a Sunday morning to help with hospitality. There's no better way to be forced to greet new people. You can help at the Apple Festival or at our fall festival here. There's a special bond that comes from serving alongside somebody else. And you know, don't be in too much of a hurry to get out of here on a Sunday. Grab a cookie and a coffee. Talk to somebody. Ask about their family and what's going on in their life. Make an effort to remember their name for next week. But you know, don't be too embarrassed if you have to ask. And we're actually really good about doing this here at Elyria Friends. Sometimes it gets to be 1 o'clock or later, and people are still here, sitting around, talking, eating another cookie. I kind of feel like a bartender at last call, you know? You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. But that's not it at all. I might be tired, but I'm also excited to see the church being what the church is called to be. And if you do feel bad for me and you want me to be able to lock up, invite that person who sits in the row in front of you to lunch. You know, hey, we're going to Applebee's. You want to come along? Or, you know, the house is a wreck, but we've got sandwich fixings. I'd love it if you'd come over. You know, the truth is, starting this kind of relationship is really far simpler than we make it out to be. You know how one preschooler will go up to another one and just ask, do you want to be friends? Sure. And off they go. Even for adults, it's really as simple as that. Jesus says, come, follow me. He invites us in to be his friends. Even within the church, our friends are going to occasionally let us down. But Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He never fails. He never leaves us or forsakes us, even when we let him down. He laid down his life for his friends. So let's be willing to get a little uncomfortable so that we can be the kind of church that creates meaningful relationships with one another in Jesus' name. Let's be the kind of friends who gather together with gladness and sincerity, drawing others to him. Because it's good for your heart. <laughs>